There's just two of us on board this 60 foot basically racing sled. With the shorthanded stuff, the single and double, it's you. You're pushing yourself as hard as you can possibly go. You know, the boat can always be pushed faster. It's how much you can actually take. It's can you still be awake to safely maintain the speeds you're doing? Can you go do this sail change right now? Are you able to push yourself? Are you able to mentally handle it? Stuff is going to go wrong. You are going to break things. You can't get it off. And it's how you can manage those situations. I'm gonna go this type of sailor is different than your average sailor. To do it at this level in an open 60, you need to be a well-rounded person with so many different skills. You have to be a whole bunch of things. You have to be a mechanic, this is an engine. You have to be a sailmaker. You have to be decent at handling rough weather. You can see it's pretty big. Bend down the hatches and get the wet weather gear on for a bumpy ride. You have to be an electronics guru. Not saying that someone who doesn't have those skills right off the bat can't do it. You know, there's definitely steep learning curves. What it takes to make a sailor, you know, it comes from the passion. And, and if you love it, then you'll put in the work to learn what you need to learn. The class we race in is called the Amoka Open 60 class. It's stripped down, there's nothing inside. It's just a carbon fiber shell, essentially, that is designed to surf and go as fast as humanly possible. With the class, there's double-handed and single-handed races. Single-handed is just one guy, one guy on board a 60-foot race yacht on his own. The double-handed is just two of us on board the 60-foot race yacht. Sandy does the single-handed stuff, and I do the double-handed stuff with him. I'm not crazy enough to do the solo, I'm not really interested in that. I like having at least one other person there, someone to bounce ideas off of, and just company. I think I'd go nuts on my own for 90 days. The first time I'd ever done any type of sort of ocean crossing alone, I did four races and the largest one was from France to the Azores and back solo. So it was 2,400 miles total by myself. After everyone was asking me questions about the race, so why, why are you doing this, that sort of thing, it was, well, it was to get to the Vendée Globe. But I had no idea that it was going to jump to an open 60 <laughs> in two years. I thought I'd have a little bit of time to think about it. <laughs> The next race that we want to do is uh, the Transat Jacques Barb from France to Brazil. Um, so that's November of 2017. And that's sort of the first step. If we can finish that race with the boat in one piece, we've kind of proven ourselves to any potential sponsor looking to get into the sport. The Barcelona World Race. So that is from Barcelona to Barcelona. It should be about 90 days, give or take. It's basically the lead up and training for the solo guys for the Avonde Globe. The Avonde Globe is the big Super Bowl. This is a trial run, I guess you could say. Because um, when you're down there in the Southern Ocean on your own for you know 60 days, it's a scary place. I've been down there, I've spent two weeks down there and it's 100 mile an hour winds and 80 foot waves and it's just basically hurricane after hurricane after hurricane and you're in constant survival mode. So a lot of guys go down beforehand two years before to test the boat and to test themselves and you go down double handed. So that's the race we'll be doing in 2018. Our pitch is that we're disruptive. The class is mainly French driven and they don't really go in behind the doors of what it takes to run a campaign like that. Day three, being a crazy 12 hours. And so we try to be on, on social media, on Snapchat, we're giving you the highs and the lows to tell people exactly what it takes to try to run one of these campaigns. We crowdfund everything we, uh, we get, so that comes from a variety of things, from people donating on GoFundMe campaign, to people coming sailing with us, um, to people buying merchandise. We're all volunteers here. Um, neither Sandy nor I have taken a paycheck. It's all about fundraising now. It's all about maintaining the campaign and the image that we're, that we're trying to display to potential sponsors. It's about keeping this boat afloat and then hopefully as a reward, maybe we can do some of these amazing races. Sandy's really good and he's had a lot of racing experience. He's got that, that tactical element and just that thought process of going into it. And you know, he's able to handle situations level-headed and stop and think about things and make the correct decision. I think again, that's, it goes back to the whole survival thing of when something goes wrong, what are you gonna do about it? 
Morgan's a co-skipper. He's also the project manager. He is a very hardworking individual. He comes from working on the oil rigs in Calgary. Um, I have a lot of respect for Morgan. I mean, he's sailed around the world on the clipper races, watch captain. Work ethic is, is bar none. Between the two of us, the work ethic is there. I think all decisions are equal. It's very much a duo team. Good sailors, certainly sailors who spend a lot more time sailing than us, have been sailing for 50 years or 20 years, who've come on uh, board. And, and it's one thing they've, they've, they've all mentioned is you guys are really level-headed. And there's no yelling and screaming and blaming. And this last tra transatlantic, a lot of stuff went wrong. And I think everybody was certainly tested. Tons of issues, tons of breakages, rip sails, electronics, you name it and we didn't see much in terms of wildlife. And then I was driving, I was the only one up on a deck. And we were about 40 or 50 miles out, so the home stretch had our uh, A5 up, um, which is our fractional kite. Have it up in big, uh, big winds, big, big surfs. And then out of nowhere, we smacked into a whale, unfortunately. We're just in a fucking whale. Um, I don't know where it came from. We were doing like 15, 20 knots. Um, and there was this loud smack. The whale was okay. I saw it surface afterwards. There was no blood. It seemed to just kind of continue on, it, on, on its way. I think it was a 50 or 60 foot humpback. It was a huge whale. It completely wiped out our starboard rudder. Should sit about here. A new one runs about 20 grand US. We were able to find a used one out of the UK and get it shipped over and we were dealing with customs and then we had to get it retrofitted to fit our boat. That took about three weeks, which put us way behind schedule. It's still a little bit longer, but it works. That's not, that's not gonna go anywhere. It's better than nothing. Certainly put a bit of a thorn in our sides. We didn't budget for that. <laughs> Um, so we had to kind of pull, pull together the money for that. There's a whole bunch of different things of why I love it, but it's those moments that, that keep you going, you know, like there's tons of moments that I hate it and there's tons of moments you just kind of want to push the game over button and get out. But at the end of the day, finishing any sale is, uh, is you're always, I'm always finishing on a high. And that's what I got addicted to, the problem solving being on your own, the fact that you can't really call for help. You know, I can't get on a phone and get a helicopter to come pick us up. Their range is maybe 300 miles and we're usually a lot further offshore than that. Uh, so it's really, it's you. And if you have problems, you sort it out. Um, and it's more so amplified now that there's just two of us on board. The time when I'm alone at sea is truly the time that I've been the happiest in my life sipping on a coffee, driving underneath the stars with 10 knots of breeze behind you. That's my image of the perfect world.